Hi, folks. Welcome to another episode of Film Study. This is Ken McCusick, and it's time to look forward to the first preseason game on the first episode of the year of what will become our matchups series during the season. It seems silly to call it that during the preseason because we're not really trying to handicap these games or even really care that much about the win or loss outcome. But we're calling it What to Look For is the series during the preseason. And joining me is my matchup host for during the season, Frazier Tafar. Frazier, how you doing? Doing good, Ken. Glad to be on for 2024 season of what to look for. And uh, we got an interesting game coming up against the Eagles. Really appreciate all all the co-hosts from the other shows. Uh, One last thing, uh, the matchup show, all the people who come on for the uh, uh, Know Your Foe series. And of course, uh, Vasil Ricos for Friday Morning GM. But uh, they make it a lot easier to get through the season and do the eight shows a week that we do here. And uh, Frazier, I, I really enjoy the stuff we get to do together. Let's look ahead to this Eagles game, though. Something that, uh, you know, we've been waiting a long time for football. We've been waiting since January 28th for a football game. And uh, we won't get much of the starters in this one. Yeah, I don't expect to see any of the big names, uh, potentially second year starters, third year starters, just maybe knocking off the rust like uh, Travis Jones or like we'll maybe put in Leonard Baum, maybe one in series just to see if he's not feeling that tissue issue. But other than that, I do expect to see the young guys to see a majority of clock. Yeah, and, and I think that's the that's the way it always goes. The the guys who are on the fringe of the roster fighting for spots are the ones who we'll see in there in the second half for sure. And we got some interesting um, matchups, and interesting roster decisions still to be made. There, are, there is. I know the the Ravens always minimize the impact of roster decisions, but this April they drafted Nick Samak as uh, a potential center to back up Linderbaum. I don't see him as really being in the picture for that backup spot right now. I think it's an open competition. I think they have several guys who who could be uh, the first up in that consideration, but I don't think Samak is it. So we'll uh, we'll talk about that a little bit with the offensive line. We'll just jump right in. Um, we've seen a couple of different guys at center the last couple of days at camp. Darian Dalcourt has spent a lot of time there, and, and Samak is healthy. He's there. Uh, he's just not taking taking the, the the top reps or the most reps. And then today it was Ben Cleveland who got a fair amount of playing time at center. We also saw a day where uh, Voorhees had a lot of playing time at center. So it's been a, a interspersing of those snaps among various players. Yeah, and I think maybe the thing that set Samak back is that he had issues during the rookie camp. Uh, with injuries, and he wasn't able to continue to get up to speed with the offense and things of that nature. So maybe he's still reaping the, I wouldn't say reward, but his doings from that and uh, continuing to go down the positioning ranking as well. And maybe Dalport is more of a reliable option in the in terms of Mustafer like we had last year, and I think we might keep that as as is. Dalcourt, a much bigger man, a guard listed at 6'3", 320. Um, I think if I had to guess why Samak is not getting as much, he's 6'4", 314, a, a leaner build out of Michigan State. I, I, if I had to guess, I'd say he doesn't have nearly the strength that Dalcourt has, mm-hmm. uh, and, and that'll take him a year to get. And and also, you know, looking at Cleveland and Voorhees, those, those are guys with grown man strength. Right. And, uh, you know, they, the Ravens need a backup potentially to get them through a ball game, potentially to take several games. Um, I just I, he's uh, same. I can't be where the Ravens want him to be, or I think we've we'd have seen more from him so far. Let's move over to Voorhees. Uh, uh, he's been in my mind, he's won the left guard job. I don't think there's any real doubt about it. It's never really been a question. He's got a lot of praise from Harbaugh. Uh, which I would take with a grain of salt, but also from the other linemen who play next to him, whether that's Linderbaum and Stanley, we've seen at the podium. And uh, and they both really like what they're seeing in Voorhees, as does the uh, offensive line coach, uh, Joe D. So lots of uh, lots of nice words. Yeah, and I know you probably don't follow Madden or anything like that, but he's ranked the second or the first strongest lineman in the game. So I don't know what that means. Yeah, they haven't seen him play, but... Either way, I'm uh, excited to see how Boris does, especially coming up against the Eagles. <clears throat> Curious to see 
what his time will be at left guard because mm-hmm. that will be the most of intrigue. Uh, I anticipate him being there for potentially a quarter and then then being shuffled along the line just for just to fill holes at that point and give other guys opportunity at left guard. Uh, but from your point of view at camp, does he seem to be handling the rush from our ones well? It's really hard to say because pressure has been pretty high for a lot of camp in terms mm-hmm. of uh, what's been given up. And it's really hard to actually pin it on individual people. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I can just say it's it's very difficult to do. They've had some padded practices. Protection has probably looked a little better since the pads have come on. Uh, Harbaugh mentioned that they're doing a better job of picking up stunts and blitzes. Yeah, I think so. But they're not really doing a great job of picking up the corner blitzes. I can tell you that for right now, that the slot corner blitzes in particular, the defense has been ruthless, relentless, remorseful in terms of sending them. And, and the offense has not shown the ability to stop those yet. Now, those are not typically the responsibility of alignment, right. but still, you, you'd like to see the the there may be shifts necessary if, to, to, to get that uh, player blocked up. And um, I'd love to think that that really portends what it has meant to the defense in this preseason so far in the game camp so far. But I kind of doubt it's going to be quite as effective as, as it's been because they've been just they've been ridiculously good in terms of getting to the quarterback. Which is honestly a good thing because it helps Lamar and the offense understand how to slide protection and then get our young running backs, not Henry and not Hill, more situated to these kind of adjustments because they've never really been into high pressure situations and our defense is always going to be fast and physical. So I love that, even though we're not maybe handling it well, but I love that we're getting those looks early. Right. I I would agree. It's interesting that the strength rating you mentioned in Madden is where it is. I, I'll say this. I don't think that strength is the is the single most important attribute by any means for an offensive line. It's nice to have grown man strength. It definitely is. But, it, you know, if he if he has a lean build, his pad level is going to play a bigger role in terms of whether or not he gives up a lot of pressures by bull rush. So I don't think we've really know yet where he is on this. I think he probably moves well enough in terms of getting on the line of scrimmage. It's certainly been something that uh, Coach Joe has been able to train out of mediocre athletes, as I've talked about on the show a number of times before, and he uh, is probably above that, I I would say. Mm -hmm. I don't know how he'll be in level two, and I really don't know how he's going to react to pressure being put on either side of him, whether that means a – um, it's some sort of stunt game that's being played where where he's facing a guy um, coming on an under where his block is at a different than a, than a straight ahead angle. I don't know really what to expect out of him. So we'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll, we'll get, I think, a pretty good look versus some pretty darn good defensive linemen against the Eagles. Yeah, I'm hoping we go against either Jalen Carter or Fletcher or whoever have they have up front, their top guys, because then we'll really see where he's at. Who's the, who's the guy that they have? Is it Davis, the the enormous guy that was drafted immediately after Hamilton? Yes, yes. Okay, yes. Him and Jalen Carter. Yeah, there's they've definitely got some some big boys up front, so that'll be good. Well, let's move on. We'll go a little quicker. Um, Daniel Falele and uh, Ben Cleveland uh, at right guard. I'd like to see how that comes up. Really big for for the for the first game is to see the order of deployment because it really is the best first cut on what the coaches believe the order of the depth chart is at this exact moment in time. And things can change from a game. We saw uh, Sala, for example, had just had implode during the preseason last year. It looked definitively not ready for the NFL, and it's affected him, frankly, ever since. Uh, but in the case of Paul Lilly and Cleveland, it'll be interesting how they how they line them up. Yeah, I uh, I'm almost – close to saying that Falele is going to be this year's Sala for Cleveland just to give him motivation. Um, yeah. Dis- disappointing it's come to that. I just think we're going to see the same kind of performance from that, like what we did lot last year with Sala, not really able to handle the pressure inside. And we could see that from Falele this preseason, just based on his prior experience on the outside of tackle and now you're bringing him inside, which is a much more faster game. 
you need to have even more better hand fighting and he hasn't shown that up to this point so i'm i'm hoping that's the case that we have another sala uh i forgot his like his name already ben cleveland or no Sa- sala and simpson simpson exactly yeah. hoping that to be this case this year yeah i think there's a pretty good bet that they end up with simpson at, at right guard i've i've kind of been pimping that the whole time and I've sat here and watched as Falele has basically gotten the bulk of the snaps um, during this camp uh, at, at right guard. Cleveland has been shuttled around a lot. He's played some right tackle. He's played some right guard. He's played some center. Uh, he's played some left guard. And I think we might see him at three positions, if I had to guess, during the preseason. I don't think he'll play right tackle because I think the Ravens have enough of those. I think you could see him at left guard, right guard, and center in this first preseason game. They need to make some kind of documentary on this Ben Cleveland situation. Cause I'm, I'm curious where it went downhill. It's yeah. almost like he doesn't want to play anymore. Like he's just there to finish out his contract, but we'll see. Uh, I mean, the kid has everything on the line this year in terms of how he's going to live the rest of his life. Yeah. If it truly doesn't matter to him. Yeah. The, the NFL will oblige him. They will, they will, you know, not look to, throw money at him anymore after this year. But if he has a big year, he, he could he make a lot of money. John Simpson just did. And uh yeah. I agree. All right, let's let's move on. We'll 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 I think we'll see some of Rosengarten. The question it, where we'll see him, will we see him at right tackle and at left tackle in this game? I think there's a pretty good chance we see him at both. Um and I think that uh, probably he gets in as soon as McCary is done uh at right tackle, which probably will be a series or two at the most. And uh, and then we'll see a fair amount of Roger Rosengarten, which I know is one of the players a lot of people want to see. Yeah, I expect him to once he takes over for McCary to be in there until the second half. Sorry, and then um, move over to left tackle and beginning in the the second half, and mm-hmm. then finish it out there. I don't see them trying to move him inside and just just doing whatever. Has he played center in practice at all? No, Rosengarten's been tackle exclusively. Okay, good. So yeah. I just think right tackle first half, left tackle second half. Yeah, he's. I I will say. Sadly, I really hope this was not true. It looked like Rosen looks like from the preseason from the camp so far that Rosengarten's anchor appears to be the problem. I would feared it was okay. that that he he is getting pushed around a lot by some linemen. You know, I, I talk about not being able to tell exactly where the pressure is coming from. He's the one guy who looks like he's getting backed up a fair amount. Josh Jones a little bit too has gotten a little pushed around in this camp, but uh, but but he's gotten he's gotten pushed around. So we'll see. Hopefully, you know, hopefully he's not that far away. Hopefully the Ravens can figure out where he fits in their twenty five plans, even without seeing him play for all of twenty four. But I think you know this preseason is a chance to get him in at a couple of different positions and see how he can help. All right, let's move on. Josh Jones, uh, you know, basically could play either tackle or guard. He's played a little bit of both um, this preseason. I don't really see him as contending for any starting role right now, uh, even with the problems the Ravens have at guard, with, you know, the potential for McCary, you know, them wanting to save him as a backup left tackle as opposed to starting him at right tackle. I mean, I don't think he's contending for the starting right tackle job in any way. Um, I think he's a pure backup and a fairly versatile backup, but not one who is particularly good. The one thing about Jones is he's had a lot of false starts in this camp. He's run a lot of laps for those because they're running a lap every time they have a false start this year. Wow. Okay. So in that case, what do you think? Like you just explained Rosengarden has issues anchoring. Where do you think Joshua Jones has his deficiencies at? Penalties. By far is the biggest thing. So, Oh, what's the biggest thing? Um, Simpson, remember how much I used to complain about his penalties? Well, yeah. Josh Jones has 36% more penalties per snap career than John Simpson did. That's not good. No, it's not good. It's in the wrong direction, and he's it's been corroborated by the false starts we've seen so far in camp. We haven't really seen a bunch of post-snap fouls. Uh, we haven't seen a bunch of post-snap fouls, period. The, the, the officials are not being overly officious jerks as uh, – as Marv Levy, I think it was, said one time uh, in terms of the, the uh, calling a lot of penalties. And, uh, you know, they're letting, it, they're letting them play. But, uh, but we'll, we'll see. I mean, Josh Jones, I can't really say I'm in a position to grade him in terms of what's happened. But I would say he's probably been pushed around a little bit in terms of some of the pressure the Ravens have created. 
And they've made it very difficult on the Ravens' backup quarterbacks in particular um, by getting getting people in and after the quarterback. All right, got to keep moving here. Tayshawn Manning is another player I am really excited to see. I think he could be um, probably fit on the final offensive line spot. You know, could be a player like Sala is competing with Manning. Sala would be in his second year. Manning is in his uh, first still. He's he spent all last year on the practice squad. Came out of Kentucky, moves pretty well, uh, but definitely has the size that the Ravens, you know, have often coveted at guard. So uh, I think he could be a uh, uh, a guy they really like. He graded out very well on a P- on PFF last preseason. I agreed in terms of the, the action. I graded for him, um, and I think he's uh, you know he, he's probably a pretty good bet to make the team. Yeah, it's like you said, it's against him and Sala, and uh, it's almost like you haven't heard a peep out of Sala all off season, and then up to this point. So it's a, uh, it's interesting to see how people get propped up one year, and next year they essentially fall off the face of the earth. And um, I'm hoping he just he makes the practice squad and continues to develop. But at this point, and our franchises. History, I don't think we have time to just drag along an offensive lineman to continue to develop. Right. And he's he's a size and shape guy that some other team may take away from the Ravens if they if they cut him. And honestly, I'm probably at a point where if that's the only road we got out of here, try and trade him. But if it doesn't work out, then you you just have to go ahead and release him and take the chance that he gets taken. Yep. All right, let's move on. Tight end, we haven't talked about it all. We haven't talked about anything but offensive line so far. Uh, I think there's only one real question here, and and the top three seem to be very well set. They had a tremendous year throwing the ball to the tight ends, but Kadir Ishmael has looked terrific in camp so far. Uh, looks like a big-bodied guy, much in the mold of Darren Waller. Mm-hmm. And I think you're, you're gonna he's going to get out there. You're going to immediately like what this guy looks like in the first preseason game. When they throw him the ball, he's got a very – Big catch radius. Uh, he's very aggressive going after the ball, catching it away from his body. Um, does a good job helping the quarterback by boxing out and coming back to him. Uh, and and he's really turned out to be a good blocker. He put David Ajabo on his rear end the other day in what was probably the highlight of the day for for that. Uh, that was I'm trying to think of what day this was. I think it was Saturday that that occurred. On. Not good for David Ajabo. No. But- <laughs> yeah, I, I'm pulling for Kadir. Uh, I'm from the Harvard County area. He grew up in the Harvard County area. So I just want him to do well and be successful. And I think uh, having someone like like we had Keaton Mitchell last year, someone who has heritage with the team. Now we have Kadir, or someone with heritage with the team. Like there is no doubt in my mind, and I hope other fans mind that these two players are willing to die for this team. Not literally, but they've grown up enjoying this team, loving this team. And when they go out there and play, they actually want to make a difference for the team because they've seen them for so long and grew rooting for them. So just having guys like that, in my opinion, goes a long way. And on top of that, Kadir is obviously making his presence known in, in the training camp. So I just can't wait to see him in action and live action. And uh, in terms of Kohler, I just want to see him continue to block well, uh, make the plays when they're there. I mean, he's going to be a part of the plans moving forward, so I really don't see any risk for his job. I just uh, I want to see Kadir continue to move his way up in the roster. Yeah, they would trade him if they were going to do it. And and uh, I th- I'm thinking they could get more than a seven for Charlie Kolar, like maybe six for, for Kolar if they traded him at this point. He's got two years left on his rookie deal. He's obviously in addition to being cheap, but Kadir has four years left on his rookie deal. And that's right. one of the reasons why they may want to um, do that. If you think about it, they could bifurcate the tight end pool into multiple years in which they graduate out. So effectively, Andrews and likely each have two years left and they're going to have to make a decision, then probably sign one, let the other go. And then it would be nice to not have another guy who's in that same spot who they might not know all that much about at the end of this year. If you look at how snaps will be divided, Kolar would be in that position. They might rather have Kadir, a younger guy, to pair up with either Likely or Anders, whoever is is going to end up staying in Baltimore. I 
I really hope they work something out with Andrews, like a hometown discount, so likely can get paid, quote unquote, with us. Because uh, I can't see Mark going anywhere else. I think my heart would break if he goes anywhere else. He's a true Raven, and I just can't see that. Well, Lamar wants to keep him, I'm sure, but I think what it would take is he would have to have the the, the Monken would have a, have to have a big year calling great 12, 12 personnel offense. And unfortunately, it was something we saw today, and we'll segue into the wide receiver position with this. Um, Bateman was hurt in practice today. I and I, I don't know if he'll, if he'll miss time or not, but it, it, it's Harbaugh was very curt about his response. We don't have information on that yet. And a lot of times he's willing to give you news he thinks is good, even if it's a slight exaggeration on the circumstance. But when I hear that kind of response, I immediately think oh, that is potentially not good at all. Um, so we'll see. It could, if, be, it could potentially be a broken rib or he could probably could have torn his oblique. One of those things. Because it seems like the report from, I think it was um, Joda Schaefer. Okay. Or, or uh, Jeff, Z, Jeff Z, Z, Zrebeck. Zrebeck, yeah. Huh? He said that uh, when Bateman went down, he got up, but he was holding his like rib cage abdomen area and walking gingerly. So, yeah, that that's the indication that I got. There's potential if Harbaugh is being like reserved about his response, that could be the issue. Yeah, it could be. It could certainly be a lot of things. If that's the case, broken rib might actually be one of the better things. If yeah. If you're if you're talking about some of those other potential injuries, because even an oblique strain, those things can last a long time. And wide receivers, they have to use that muscle a lot. Yep. And, and they're so do all football players. Um, but anyway, it's uh, it's hopefully something's not coming out. We'll say this: the Ravens have three different guys who've looked very good to me in camp in different roles. Dayton Wade, I really want to see get on the field against the Eagles. Malik Cunningham uh, is you know fairly versatile receiver. And Sean Ryan, who's a is a bigger guy, uh, can certainly play on the outside. He, he honestly might end up being the X receiver for the Ravens if if Bateman were hurt. They've got Aguilar, so they might start with him and and have Ryan as a backup. But uh, boy, it's uh, it'd be a very very difficult to deal with world if Rashad Bateman is hurt. Yeah, and I think um, I'm curious to see how Sean Ryan continues his progress from last year because. He did look good in the preseason, and he had that touchdown and that decent game. Um, I think uh, – what's your opinion on Scotty Washington? I mean, he's a tight end for starters, so Isaiah Washington is the wide receiver. And let me confirm that because oh. I sometimes have been getting them mixed up. 80, 86, Isaiah Washington is a wide receiver, and Scotty Washington yep. is a tight end. Isaiah so, Washington, yes. Uh, so it's not that Isaiah Washington has been bad. I just wouldn't put him on the same level as those other three guys. Wade does look like a very dangerous, um, awesome option for jet motion and gadgetry. Um, Mm -hmm. Cunningham has looked like a guy who's uh, dangerous out of the slot or potentially out of the Z. It'd be a guy who can give you good crossing routes. I don't really think of him as an X receiver. He probably has a lot of development as a route runner to get there. Um, and Sean Ryan is is probably the the most um, – well, he's the largest of those three receivers. Let's put it that way. Okay. Uh, let me see, see what Ryan is about, what, 6'3"? Ryan is – yeah, 6'3", 200. So it, it, the, the Ravens like their larger receivers. The other guy who, who could potentially get significantly more playing time um, is Tez Walker. Mm-hmm. So, I, you know, it's he's been a strange case in camp because he seems like – He's he's taken some really cheap shots this camp from Christian Matthew a couple times. I forget who got to give him the third one, whether it was Simpson, because he's he's dished out a lot of cheap shots in this camp. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, he's just playing very physical. Um, but but it's whatever the case. Um, uh, Walker has made some fine plays, and then it seems like he gets hit and things start to go wrong. Either he loses the football or or he. Um, uh, I can't play the next day or, or other things. So uh, yeah, while I really want to see him on the field and what he can do vertically for this offense, um, I'm not sure he makes a lot of sense at the X receiver at this point in his career. He's another guy who I think who has a lot of work to do as a route runner, to develop the complementary routes to make his deep routes effective. He's got to have a good comeback route. 
specifically to, to, to make his deep routes effective. Referring to Tez Walker, correct? Yeah. Referring to Tez. Okay. Got it. Uh, you didn't put Tyron Wallace on your on your list. No, Tyron not? Wallace is the sixth guy who's already made the team. And and Deontay Hardy has been has missed some time. So I didn't talk about him either, but but you know, Wallace will be in there returning kicks. The other guy who probably will do it is Dayton Wade in this game. Uh Wade would be a guy who could could return kicks, could return punts. They did punt drills today, and Wade looked very natural uh tracking the football. Wallace looked natural enough tracking the football. He's generally getting underneath it fairly well, but he had a couple of problems where he dropped the ball. So it's not something that Harbaugh tolerates for very long. So right. I, you, we could we could see a case where Wade gets an opportunity or two, I think, returning kicks. Okay. And uh, one more, Deontay Hardy, has he factored into the offense at all from what you've seen? He's hardly practiced. So it's, it's uh, you know, he's has he been, has he caught a few balls? Sure. Um, the time that Hardy was at practice, Lamar wasn't. And nice. so he had these, you know, this buckshot shooting that's going on from the backup quarterbacks that's very scattered. Yeah. Um, you know, that's all, you know, and Hardy is trying to catch it on some fly routes and some you know, other routes that yeah, require no a little way. bit of accuracy. Yeah. Okay, that's fair. Yeah, but I there's nothing there's nothing that's disqualified Hardy from being an effective part of the offense from what I've seen so far. We just we haven't seen him in any good situation to date. All right, let's move on and talk about running back a little bit. We know we won't see Derrick Henry very much in this game. Will he get a couple of carries? Possibly. Should he get a couple of carries? Probably not. Yeah. Um, the only thing I'd like to see from Derrick Henry in this game. And it's only if they're willing to put Lamar out there is whether or not Lamar and he have a have kind of a um, um, symbiotic relationship with a mesh point. I, it, Henry, as good as he is, if he has too tight a cage, or if he wants to transact too early with Lamar, will reduce Lamar's value by not allowing him the late pulls that have made him very successful. And Gus Edwards had a lot of problems with that, by the way. Coming up, they came up in 2018. Lamar had a ton of fumbles. Many of them were on the exchange with with Henry, and uh, and they you know they had time to figure it out, and they and they eventually became very good at it together. I think that that uh, with Henry, when Monken was last at the podium, he said you know really haven't had a chance to evaluate it yet in terms of Henry and the mesh point mesh point. And that's a little concerning because, like you said, that's a really big part of Lamar's game, just this decisiveness and being able to manipulate a defense with that. Um, in my opinion, I don't think he'll probably dress up this game. I think he'll be on the sideline. I think we'll see uh, Justice Hill get the nod for the first preseason game. And then from then on, like you like you said, I want to see the order, who comes out first, whether it be Owen or Ali. And mm-hmm. uh, I mentioned to you in the production meeting, uh, Collier, Chris Collier, I want to see mm-hmm. what he does because I've seen just the little glimpses of camp has a little burst, has quick feet, and I just want to see where he is compared to Ali. Yeah. Um, I, Collier has done some things that have been kind of impressive. He's caught the football and had some yak. He got through a pretty tight little crease the other day. He also put the ball on the ground once. So mm-hmm. um, he, it's, he, he hasn't had a lot of opportunities, um, and I'd say he does not look like much in terms of pass blocking from what I've seen in the running back inside linebacker drills. Uh, which I would expect. I would expect that to be, you know, a shortcoming. Ali probably is even worse as a as a pass blocker. Just not. It's he's way too small at the NFL level to do it. Uh, and he wasn't good in college either. It's not like I'm I'm coming up this out of thin air or anything. Owen Wright has looked pretty good as a pass blocker. He's looked like he's had some juice as a runner and as a receiver. So it wouldn't shock me if probably still doesn't make the team. Ali will make the team over him but that if they have a need for a running back, as always seems to occur with injuries during the year, that, that Owen Wright could well get some practice squad elevations there, and those practice squad elevations can turn into a roster spot once somebody's lost for the season. Okay, that's reasonable. I'm a, I just want to see what are the options we have out there, just in the case of uh, Keaton Mitchell not being exactly who he was last year yeah. and having a really good contingency, contingency plan for that. Yeah, 
I, 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 they don't have anything that's a, that's a really good contingency plan for Keaton Mitchell, who's who's a, a superstar. But but Keaton Mitchell will be back at some point this year. Hopefully, he'll be able to ramp back up and then be back fully in 2025. Okay. Um, if if he could get, I think 50 carries this year, it'd be great. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily going to happen. I think he'll be back sometime in the second half of the year. Um, and I'll tell you what else would be great. I'll take zero during the regular season if he come back in the postseason and help the Ravens a little bit. Hundred uh, percent. Yeah. No. I I am almost anticipating him being back week ten or week twelve. Mm-hmm. It has, it's going to be really late in the year because uh, I know we have PTSD with J.K. Dobbins, and we don't want another situation where we put our top running back at risk again just to rush him on the field when we have enough people to yeah, carry that, the load until he's ready. That was a bad situation for multiple reasons, but the the fault in in large part rests with Dobbins who said, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. I don't want to be held back. I'm ready to play. I'm ready to play. I'm ready to play. You have a star player who's saying that basically and doing so unwisely. And then you, you, you watch him run the football and he's carrying a piano on his back. Yeah. Um, you know, just, it, it, it didn't make any sense for him to be, uh, uh to be hurried Respect. back. Yeah. Yep. All right. All right. Let's move on. The quarterback competition. And I using air quotes with that. Um, <laughs> Isn't much. I mean, I, I don't really think from watching camp that Leary is a legitimate option to be the number two behind Jackson. I think it's Johnson really at the only right now. It's just a matter of what do they do with Leary, I guess. Do they hold him, use up a roster spot on a third quarterback, which I guess they might, or do they just cut him, center the practice squad, let him work with the team, and hopefully nobody else takes him. Um, and then he maybe he's available at some point later during the year. But it's I, I – if they were in a nuclear situation where Jackson was lost and Johnson needed a backup, I don't, I don't, not even sure they'd go to Leary under those circumstances. I think they might go to the street. Wow, so, you think it's been that bad for Leary this camp? I, I, you know, there's things he could do that look like an NFL quarterback, and then there's a whole bunch of other ways in which he doesn't look like an NFL quarterback, um, and doesn't look like he would function very well within the Ravens' offensive scheme, also. Uh, does one thing he does very well is to make multiple play action fakes on the same play, kind of like late career Manning would do. Mm-hmm. You know, so basically you fake a throw, fake a handoff, then you make a throw somewhere else. So you 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 had two two different fakes that that you know force the defense into going the wrong way. Um, but other than that, I, I you know he's a pocket quarterback. He's not a runner, and um, I think it'll be difficult for him. Interesting why we wasted a pick on him then. Yep, and on Samac, and maybe on Sanusi Kane as well. So yeah, and Ali. Yeah, Ali. I, I still have hope. I still have hope. But okay. their top, their top four rounds of picks, I still like. And TJ Tampa, uh, we haven't seen him yet at all this He's year. Still hurt, so right. Yeah. Well, let's move on to the defense anyway. Talk a little bit about that. Uh, the interior defensive line, the roster is essentially set for the Big Five, and I hope these guys don't see much playing time at all. But with the number of defensive linemen needed for a preseason game, you're probably going to see some of them for some of the first half. So maybe Jones plays a little bit. Maybe Matt BK plays a couple series. And then they start rotating into a second tier of guys. And they've got a couple of veterans they're working with in Josh Tapau, who he tackled Lamar Jackson in the open field once. That's probably the highlight of his entire career. Wow. He's been in the league for seven years. And Deidre Sanat, uh, nose tackle, has been in the league for six years, is another guy. So they have two veterans, and they have two rookies in C.J. Ravenel, who had two sacks the other day on consecutive plays, and Tramel Walther, who's out of Georgia. So the, you know, they've got they've got old, they've got young, they've got a lot of different ways to try it um, during the let's call it the last three quarters of this football game. And it'll be interesting to see how. Every year, data breaches are on the rise. In 2022, the number of victims shot up nearly 41.5% from the previous year. And your personal information is at risk. With hundreds of commercial databases ready to be hacked and that number of victims, it keeps going up each year. Plus, the U.S. has another big data privacy problem, the people search sites. You guys have all seen these. These are websites that create detailed personal profiles on millions of Americans and then publish them online for anyone to see. Your address, your phone number, even family details are just a click away. But there's a way to protect yourself. Meet Incogni. Incogni reaches out to data brokers on your behalf, requests the removal of your personal data, 
and handles any objections they may have. This means less stress for you and more peace of mind. With Incogni, you can safeguard your information from cyber criminals who steal social security numbers and other sensitive personal data to commit identity theft. Imagine the relief of knowing that your personal data is no longer easy prey for hackers. Incogni also protects you from data brokers selling your information to companies to target vulnerable and disadvantaged groups, exposing you to even more discrimination. These lists with titles like Tough Start, Young Single Parents, Rural and Barely Making It can harm you both online and offline. Don't let personal data, don't let your personal data fall into the wrong hands. Take control with Incogni today. Visit incogni.com slash film study and safeguard your privacy now. It's time to reclaim your digital security. That's incogni slash film study. I N C O G N I dot com slash film study. Incogni, your shield in a digital world. They align those guys, whether they go one young, one old, and both halves kind of thing, or, or exactly how they do it. Yeah, Walter is a little light. He's only 273, and the rest of the defensive line is over 300. So I don't know how that will fare in if his strength is an element. I have 283 on the Ravens roster here. I don't know what that, you know, it's, it's, it's still too light, but yeah. it's, but it's a little bit, he's, he probably projects more like a five tech, like Brent urban as mm-hmm. a guy who'd be in, be in there in a base defense, obviously in this kind of a preseason game in the second half, um, trying to close something out. But uh, yeah, he's, he's small. He's that's definitely small. <laughs> yeah, I just I'm just gonna see how he anchors well in the. Well, just sits when he's going against up against bigger guys and trying to hold his uh hold his own in the in the gap. He he should be going up against the Eagles threes, I would think. So it should be some chances against some players who are not going to make the team and and you know are on the fringe of having their NFL careers ended. So yeah, uh, it should enough. be should be an opportunity. Let's move on to the edge. Uh, the obviously the really disappointing news from about a week ago now is that Malik Ham is out for the season, um, and he was the guy I was really hoping for because you know Sam linebacker characteristics, uh, local kid, which is always a nice story. Seemed to be rushing the passer pretty effectively this this camp, um, but no longer. Yeah, very tough. Malik Ham was someone on my radar as well. I thought. He had really good twitch, gets off the line pretty fast, and that's something that we value here uh, in lights of Terrell Suggs, Adafi Owe. Just getting that extra second was essential, and Ham had that. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how he comes back next year after another injury, and he had a leg injury last year, correct? Uh, actually, I don't remember. I don't remember what the problem was. It might have been. Might have been. Uh, I, don't, I don't remember actually. So he was. He's. He's going to accrue another year of service, which is the issue since he's on IR. Right. And and that means he's going to be a third year player next year, which is not a good place to be with no professional experience effectively. Yep. And I'm just hoping he can retain some of that explosiveness, so we can get some value out of it as well. Yeah. And it sucks that as he's down, also Adisa Isaac is still on NFI, and yeah. that's very upsetting after yeah. we smashed a decent pick on him. So I don't know what to what to think of what's going on with that because Harbaugh mentions him about every second or third time he's at the podium as being a guy they're going to get back and they hope to get back soon. And, and says kind of the, some of the same things about TJ Tampa. Tampa's on PUP. So he, that might lot well last into the season. I think I get the impression that the injury to Adisa Isaac is like a nagging hamstring injury that he has to get by, pass a conditioning test, get on the field, and then we'll see, you know, some snippet of what the Ravens have with this potentially very talented player. I I, I would not rule out the possibility that he at some point the Ravens shut him down for the year because they don't really want to waste the year of eligibility. And I don't know what the rules are related to that. I don't know if they if they have to get an agreement from anybody, but uh, but specifically from Isaac and his people. But uh, if 
if they could retain the extra year of eligibility, it obviously is a much better position, as we've seen with with uh, Voris, than it is has been with Ajabo, who was on NFI, came back after half a season, just played a tiny little bit, a couple of games at the end, um, just a few snaps, and then and then uh, the next year is lost after what a game and a half or something. Yep. Yeah. I th- yeah, and Ojabo has fallen out of favor with me. I think uh, his just like Dobbins, his uh, forcing his way back is has cost him and the Ravens in terms of contractual control over a player, um, and also his development. On top of that, he's gonna go into his third year with no real film, no real production, just like Ham is gonna go into next year, and. I know he expects the world, but this preseason game, he almost has to play the whole first half into the third quarter. I want to see a lot of David Ajabo. Um, I I mean, they do maybe need to hold him back a little bit, not to push him to the point where he gets re-injured again, but I want to see him continue to grow, especially in the run game and – being able to contain the edge because that was something last year that was looked very, bad. very disappointing. Yeah, it looked bad in the preseason, that's for sure. And during the regular season, didn't look that much better. Tavius Robinson should see some playing time too. I think we'll see some of Malik Harrison, who's he was at the podium today, one of the Ravens' really valuable, versatile players. And I think that as of right now, we'll see Tavius Robinson playing a lot of Sam linebacker, a lot on what is effectively the offensive right side where the tight end usually is, or following the tight end, you could call it that. Um, and he dropped the coverage a lot, was typically only used in the base defense, which means he's in and there mostly on first down and you know first and 10, and where a run is is um, more likely than, than uh, it would otherwise be. And then, you know, you have Davis Robinson on the other side playing that rush side, Um, And that's not enough snaps for him individually. He's looked better as a pass rusher this camp, which is nice uh, because the Ravens are very short. And I'm, I'm, I'm getting pretty close to the point where I think the Ravens might go out and get another veteran outside linebacker, which I didn't think was going to happen, but you know, now Mm -hmm. since then, Adisa Isaac is still on NFI and, and um, I was really uh, hoping ham was that guy. Yeah. and, And ham that's, he's the other one. Exactly. So, you know, they may need another veteran and the Ravens have been good at that. And the nice thing about it is they can kind of take it from an inside linebacker spot because I think they're counting on Malik Harrison to step in at inside linebacker if things don't work out. Do you think they go back to Unique Ignacue? Because I think he might be the best pass rusher out there. He's still available? Yes. Yeah. So... I'd have to look at him for age and production last year and whatnot. I, I won't say it's impossible. Uh, if they think he fits, then they do it. I, I for Just some based reason, on circumstances when he came on the trade last time, will that yeah. be an issue? You know. Yeah, and it could be. I mean, you know, it it, it uh, some of it may depend on things we can't see, like how mm-hmm. much he really and his agent really hoard themselves around to the rest of the league in terms of trying to get maximum value and levering levering what the Ravens were doing Mm -hmm. that we might not be able to see in terms of making some offer. Uh, What the Ravens typically do with players when they say, go ahead and test the market, at least in the Aussie era, was they just give them a kind of a baseline figure uh, going out to, to hit free agency. And they say, here, we'll at least start with this. And if somebody else gives you better offers, come back to us and we'll talk. We'll we'll have a discussion if 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 this is reasonable. Market conditions may have changed. Right now, this is the best we can do. It's usually a very, very baseline offer. Like this year, they might have offered a player like Geno Stone five million dollars a year for three years or something, or they yeah. might have offered Gus <laughs> Gus Edwards, and he got seven and a half or something, and and uh-huh. or they might have offered Gus Edwards, um, you two know, two million dollars. Yeah, exactly. Right. And 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 it, and it'd be it'd be something that that uh, the player doesn't really like, but at least it gives them a baseline for negotiation with their next team and, and, you know, something they can, they can work on. It it is much more difficult working in the market otherwise. And also the Ravens, you know, then kind of are more likely to get that compensatory pick that they really crave because the player is more likely to go out and get the contract they want. Now, unfortunately the guy that didn't happen for, because he just wasn't as good as, as he thinks he is, is Patrick Queen. Uh, yeah, he, he just didn't get the money that uh, that the Ravens or he hoped he would get. 
I wonder how much uh, weight his statement holds when saying other people offered him more money than Pittsburgh and he decided to go. I, th- I think it is 100% bullshit. I, I, I call bullshit absolutely. I don't think for a moment that either Patrick Queen or his agent would turn down money uh, uh, that was even, say, two or $3 million higher than what he got with Pittsburgh. And he was, you know, he was basically telling people he's going to exceed 70 million on four years. And he got you know, 41 million over three with the Steelers. Yeah. I mean, uh, teams are not oblivious to the fact he's a Roquan merchant. He's uh, a yeah. Mike McDonald student of, he's just a product of his, his defense. I mean, you put him, I'm, I'm very, very interested to see what Patrick Queen does with Pittsburgh. And I'm definitely rooting against him. Of with course. No shame either. Yeah. And it's like, I can't wait for him to look stupid out there because he's going to get exposed at Mike. The, f- the fact that he's a stealer now is yeah. is enough reason to root against him. You don't need any special reason, but it is exceptionally good that the Ravens have a player there who might be given a lot of trouble by Derrick Henry. It is yep. exceptionally you know positive to think that. Yeah. He doesn't even tackle, so I, I just can't wait for Henry to just blow his face off. <laughs> All right, let's keep going. Uh, inside linebacker, a couple guys I want to see. I, I do want to see Josh Ross on the field. And mm-hmm. the Ravens have Malik Harrison will get time there and board will get time at inside linebacker in this first game, I'd be convinced. Um, I wasn't, by the way, I'm a little surprised, having seen it occur now, that Malik Harrison is really uh, the backup Mike. You know, his kind of body has been made. He got a lot bigger to play Sam. He listed at 259 last year. Let me see where he lists right now. Just uh, I think that's worth Taking a quick look at Malik Harrison currently listed 255, which is is you know much more weight than an inside linebacker typically carries, and it's it's uh, he's looked very good in this preseason. He's had he's had some plays. He's had a couple picks. He's I think he had a fumble recovery. Uh, he was right in the way on a on a pass that got overthrown today. It would have been intercepted if it was on target. Uh, he got a lateral from from uh, Marlon Humphrey today on a on a pick. Nice, but anyway, he's. Uh, I, th- I think uh, Malik, him being Mike, is obviously to me it makes sense, regardless of what his weight has came to be, f- just to adjust for the Sam role. I think uh, he's always going to be a two down thumper, and he's going to make his money in that role. Uh, God forbid. Roquan go down, then we're in some real shit mm-hmm. with trying to figure out how we can deploy. I think that's when we go back to the dime on third down. Yeah, I, that's exactly choice. what would happen. I'm I'm yeah. convinced that's what would so it'd be Simpson would go to it would be a two Mike. down will and a third down Mike. Yep. It'd be a two down will, third down Mike. And then they bring in a dime to replace Simpson's vacated spot uh there. It make that just makes the most sense to me by far. If they somehow decided Oh no, we got to give Chris Board a chance because of this. I, I would be livid yeah, no way. about yeah. that. We cannot go to nickel if he's not yeah. there because it just doesn't work. Yeah. I don't even think we can go to nickel now. Well, we'll see how Simpson does and how we accumulate the passing game on this level. But just, um, yeah, you know me. I want I want to go back to the dime anyway. Well, I, I, you know, I'm a big fan of the dime as well. I, I'm, I think benefit of the doubt goes to Simpson. First opportunity to fail is has mm-hmm. been earned by Simpson. Uh, and I think basically based on the way that the Ravens played so effectively with a committed nickel last year and that Orr is a committed nickel himself uh, yeah. as being a three down will that I, I think I think the Ravens will start with that. And then if it fails, it fails and they'll move on. Um, I hope that, you know, if I, I've asked Zach Orr the question already this year and he basically said, no, the dime is one of the things we're going to use as you know, going to be maybe opponent dependent and whatnot by the way his answer is out there just go listen to it don't let me paraphrase it for you but i I definitely did not get the impression that the dime is ever going to be a first choice of his yeah from his answer (laughs) so that's fair uh it was what it was i think uh going back to the inside linebackers i i know i've talked about josh ross on this show at at hand i mean i i enjoy his play his instinctual play at linebacker uh I think he was nicked up last year as well, too, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm hoping he can get through this camp healthy and continue to show that he has the ability to play the weak side linebacker role and just continue to be option if Simpson either needs a breather or 
God forbid, goes down and we have to plug him in, I think I'd be comfortable with Josh Ross if he continues to get reps and understand the game and the speed because he's going to have Roquan next to him, an all-pro, and he's going to be able to adjust well because he already has the IQ. Yeah, he, and he, he probably is a two-down player if he if he comes in. He's a two-down will with a dime if he yep. if he has to replace Simpson. But I'd say I would say he's looked pretty good this year. In fact, he had two really nice run stops today. It's just run drills, but a part of that is knowing what gap you're supposed to be in. And and twice exactly. in a row on consecutive plays, you know, he was right where he needed to be to to bottle the ball carrier up. So I'm 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 optimistic. I one of the things we saw from Ross in his uh, first season was a little bit more ability to play coverage. And I hope we see that in the first preseason game. So that, that'd be one of the things I'm looking for. Oh, that'd be even more valuable for him because he can hit the hole as a, as a run stopper. But yeah. that, that second level, that passing game is how you get your money in the NFL. So the cornerback position we'll move on to here. There's been a few players in camp who have kind of uh, look good with the the biggest being Marlon Humphrey, who just looks like his superstar self of old again, which is unbelievably good. It would be even better if we could reverse the play of Nate Wiggins and Marlon Humphrey at this point, because it'd make the decision to say goodbye to Marlon Humphrey very easy. And you'd have the cheaper option that you'd be you'd be keeping for for more years in yeah. Nate Wiggins. <laughs> but but the truth of the matter is Nate Wiggins has looked like he's had a real problem adapting to the NFL. And Marlon Humphrey, he has had a pick, but Marlon Humphrey has had about five, six picks now. Uh, he's been all over the field. Uh, it almost looks like he knows exactly where the ball is coming from, particularly from the Ravens' backup quarterbacks. And he's also intercepted Lamar several times. So it's it, he's just he's playing at a level that we haven't seen before. Um, I, I, I'm still kind of hopeful that he can transition into being a safety with the Ravens, uh, possibly at some point. He says those conversations have not yet occurred. But uh, but you know I'm I'm so hopeful that it might. Uh, have you uh, seen the visible difference in his weight loss this year? Oh yeah, he's he looks a lot thinner. People have commented okay. on that. Yeah, he looks he, he looks like he's moving around very well, still being very physical to the amount it's still allowed in these games. Um, still looks physical at the point of the ball, but the old Marlon Humphrey was was relying a lot on the baseball bat arms to dislodge the football or even to, to, to cause forced fumbles after the, the, you know, the reception was all the way in hand. This right. Marlon Humphrey is just finding the ball in the air and, and nice. snagging it, taking it away or knocking it away. He's, he's, there's very little post catch contact has been necessary for Marlon in camp so far. Okay. Cause the big thing last year was Marlon would almost get left midway through the route and, that seemed to be an issue, a reoccurring issue on deep balls going towards him. So I'm hoping to see a big difference in him continuing to be able to stay with the receiver and make plays on the ball because even in his heyday, he wasn't making interceptions. So yeah. I'm, I, I really want to see that from Marlon. Yeah. As he said, the, the, we have definitely seen step-for-step coverage a fair amount. I have a you know a code for that I put right in the book when I'm as I'm recording the plays. And we've seen a lot of him forcing the receiver to the boundary, which is kind of the old Marlon Humphrey, Jimmy Smith, Ike Taylor way of playing that right corner position in particular. Um, you, you deny space to that to that player. Actually, I mean, he's the left corner now, I guess. So he's a guy who could do it uh, hopefully on either side. But uh, you make it difficult for the for the quarterback to have any any remaining space to fit that football in. What do you think the uh, issue has been with Nate Wickens so far in camp? So one of the things I really liked about him, and that and it was a corroboration of fantastic um, measurables, including that four twenty eight forty and and other things, other elements of his measurements, was the fantastic coverage results. I think in college it was a lot of um, reliance on makeup speed, which is really evident from a low penalty total. He only had one penalty all of last year. So I, I think that we've seen uh, him rely on his makeup speed here, and he's just been trailing a lot. And it's going to happen in seven on seven drills, and it's going to happen in 11 on 11 when the defense isn't really playing all out or the or the defensive line is is has some brother-in-law stuff going on with the offensive line. It's going to happen. But it just it would be better if he were more of a force in individual coverage matchups than he has been so far in camp. Yeah, and I don't think 
but to your point, we're seeing that in 11 on 11 and drills such as that. But I think when the game comes, we're going to see, continue to see the two high shell that the Ravens have played all year last oh, yeah. year. And that's going to leave him less exposure on the outside, play that mid to short and continue to make plays on the ball and keep his eyes in the backfield. I think uh, once he continues to get a grasp of that, that's when we'll be able to see more man coverage and probably obviously on third down. I know or has came up all the way through the ranks through wink. And I'm pretty sure the Rex Ryan DNA has touched him as well. So pressure on third down. So he has to be able to step up and man coverage on those situations. But I think as the year goes on, we'll continue to see him get more comfortable. Yeah. It's they need to find it, find it out. And honestly, it'd be nice if they, if he didn't just face backup quarterbacks all during this preseason, which yep. means he's got to, he's got to start. Well, I mean, you're all, if, if they follow the Ravens model, you know, they'll play Lamar basically a quarter or less the entire preseason. And if other, if other teams are doing that, you don't really have an option to face, you know, good quarterbacks. Even if you're Nate Wiggins, you start every game. If, if that's what the Ravens want to do, you still don't have a good chance to face good quarterbacks. So he's going to have to get that playing time in rotation during the season which means either Humphrey has to move to the slot on some plays or Humphrey has to move to safety on some plays with, with Hamilton in the slot, which either one, in my opinion, is viable. Um, but anyway, I, I, it'll be interesting to see how they, how they lay it out. I, I, don't think, I don't think you have to give Eddie Jackson the same role that Geno Stone had last year. Okay. So, so that would be like a full-time half-field guy whenever um, Hamilton is moving up. Okay. Uh, I don't think you have to give him that. I think I think he could he could play you know two thirds as many snaps as Stone, which means there's another um, you know call it twenty five percent of the snaps that might be available for someone else to be in there at corner with Humphrey at safety. Say okay. Now they again they haven't talked about this happening yet. It just it seems like it would make sense. Probably if it happens, it'll be a function of injury. Um, right now the Ravens are pretty well set on the back end. They have Daryl Worley, who's another guy I want to see on the back end. Uh, they still have Ardarius Washington, who's been practicing at safety, but I think is is a much more natural slot corner, uh, who we'll see in this in this first game. Um, but it'll be it'll be they've got a lot of options in the secondary, is what uh what you're what you're hearing. I think where where the where they're gonna be end up being short is probably not at safety now, it's probably at outside corner. With Tampa okay. out, they're really at three. I don't really trust JAD. Other people like him more, um, uh, you know. And, and then they've got a, after that, it's a it's a it's a fairly steep drop off of other players. You're talking about. How has our favorite corner looked so far, JAD? Up and down. Um, okay. I still don't find like he finds the football the way he should in the air. Um, mm. I think he may. I think he probably has a pick this this. Pre this camp already, almost everyone does. Our Darius Washington <laughs> just got a, just got on the board today with a with a big pick six and a backflip for the touchdown. Uh, uh -huh. But but it's in terms of of uh, um, JAD. If you listen to the coaches, he's playing great, great, everything's fine. Yeah. Um, if 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 you actually like watch him play by play, what's going on? He has some, you know, he has some of the same step by step coverage which we saw last camp. But you have to then be able to both touch the receiver and find the football in the air uh, at the same time, so you can keep track, you know, um, uh, by contact with the receiver on where he is, and then also uh, go up and get the football and time that up properly. And that's the thing he just hasn't put those pieces together yet. So you're saying when he's in phase with the receiver and obviously he has a hand on him just to make sure where he's at. When he turns, he's having that issue when he looks for the football. He's just losing the guy. Yeah, I, I mean that's that's been my feeling about how his whole career to date has gone. JT also the other problem is he's hardly played any preseason. Yeah, ball. exactly. So uh, he hasn't played any in the regular season to speak of either. So that means he has almost no NFL experience in his third year here. Um, they're gonna have to they're gonna have to figure out pretty quickly what they want to do about him. I think I think based on having a solid camp and not having like a bunch of double negatives and triple negatives attached to his name, which I wouldn't say has happened um, that I think that he's made the team, but a player like Kadar Holman, if he were to come up with a big preseason, uh, he's a guy who's 30 now, uh, but was extremely fast when he came out of Toledo, a 439 guy. 
and could could be a, a guy who would threaten JAD. Um, probably not, but but you know if you if you're talking about trying to find somebody who who maybe has looked okay. I'm trying to think if there's anybody else on the team who I'm forgetting about. So Mollet is in the slot, of course. Brandon Stevens is on the outside. We're counting Owen as, as either the number one or number two guy along with Humphrey. Uh, Pepe, I don't think, is going to make the team, but we'll see. He might be used really? for returning kicks. Yeah, that would be my feeling now. Yeah, yeah, even I, at slot? I mean, he's he's behind a lot of people. He's behind Mollet and Ardarius Washington and Hamilton at slot. Mm, that's so fair. how do you fit him in there? Are you going to fit him in at safety? Well, now he's got four safeties ahead of him for sure, plus Ardarius Washington, plus you know uh, other guys they drafted. So I, I don't really see that. And, and Pepe is a is a uh, third year player, so the, a lot of the sand is as uh, ticked out of the hourglass. So I just mm. I honestly, unless they envision some other return role for him that that I'm not considering here. I just don't see him as making the team. We'll we'll see, but I I wouldn't see it as happening. That's disappointing. I, I well, Eric DeCosta loves to say you can never have enough corners. I hope we have him on speed dial, or we can retain him on practice yeah. squad. Yeah, that's I mean that's a possibility because I don't think yeah. there's a lot of demand for Pepe at this point. That's I think good. They, they can cut him and they can put him on the practice squad. Because um, I think he would be the right the person right underneath Ardarius Washington. They're almost the same build, the same type. So I feel like they're essentially interchangeable in their play. Yeah. And I think is Ardarius in his fourth year now, or Ardarius still in his third year? Ardarius Washington is still in his third year also. So that right there, he has a big advantage because Ardarius Washington has probably more significant experience now after this camp in terms of playing safety. So if he, if he, he could, I don't like Ardarius Washington at strong safety. I don't like him in the half field role because I think he's too small for the tackling responsibilities of the position, but, but I do like, the um, the versatility is being able to get you through a portion of a game. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I guess it could be forced to get you through a portion of a season too, but um, you know, Daryl Worley is a better choice for, for that. Or Darius Washington is a third-year player, but he's been with the team for four years, right? That's correct. So he, he, one of his years didn't qualify because he was – Cut. Injured. Uh, no, no, the injured would. If he's injured, he, he, he gets credit for the year, like last year, okay. for example. But but if it, there's there was some other condition where he, he didn't, he might have spent a spent a fair amount of time on the practice squad and didn't accumulate six games. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly what it was. But okay. uh, but he didn't. He didn't, he's been around for a while, and his yeah. name has been circulating for years now. So yeah, you're you're absolutely correct. And I've been through these mental gymnastics before at trying to figure out why wasn't he effectively a fourth year player now, but I think it was last year. Why wasn't he a, a third year player and only a second year player? And I, I, I remember that it, that it proved to be correct, but I couldn't figure, I, I couldn't figure out why. And I think Brian McFarland explained it to me and I did not retain it. So I'm sorry, <laughs> to, sorry to have that happen, but that's the sort of thing. What's uh, your, uh, what's your take on Eddie Jackson so far in camp? Uh, he's looked okay, um, largely in position. Uh, had a pick right away when he when he when he showed up, which was nice. Um, seems to be a guy. Okay, so you know, I, I did an Eddie Jackson show. I certainly have. I, I I wasn't real crazy about him as the choice, but I guess what I'd say is that um, the Ravens are going to give him a more limited role than what he had in Chicago. And I think mm-hmm. he was asked to do a lot in Chicago. And we've seen how much better a player Roquan is here in Baltimore than he was in Chicago. I think we could see the same thing. I think you have a guy who just, he had too large a role as a full-time free safety in Chicago. And a split field role is probably about, you know, 80% of the coverage responsibility in terms of the, 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 the amount of the field you have to cover, half field versus maybe 60 to 65% of the field, let's say. Right. And uh, I, I think that that probably hurt him. He has not been a good tackler in his career, so that that has hurt him, and that might continue to hurt him. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm not sure about that. And in, in 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 that way, I don't see him as being way ahead of our Darius Washington. But then Geno Stone had a bad tackling year last year, and the Ravens were fine with it. They they were able to get through despite it. So I think if, if it all comes down to his ball hawk and second man of the ball skills, is going to be good on tip balls. Is he going to be a good guy for uh, pouncing on a fumble right away or knocking a fumble loose as second man of the ball? 
Mm-hmm. If those if those things are good, then then Eddie Jackson his turnovers will be worth it. For what it's worth, Eddie Jackson had five of his six career defensive touchdowns during those first three seasons. In the last four seasons, which I've aggregated in, in a lot of the work I've done, he's averaged 10 yards per target allowed um, over that if you use the PFR targets as opposed to the PFF targets. Um, and he's had a, a 14.5% missed tackle rate for his career. I think it comes down to better structure, better team, better play. Fair enough. And I'm, I almost – I really did want a, a headhunter at our strong safety position only because the missed tackles last year really didn't come to bite us in the AFC championship game, but there was games where tackle was just abysmal and it was tough to see, especially Geno Stone and Patrick Queen. They're probably the worst two tacklers on the team. In my opinion, I'm kind of glad that they're not part of it because part of the team this year, because they did become liabilities when people were in open space, especially Geno, because he would just, stay high and expect to get the ball out or something. So I'm hoping that the limited role does help, uh, does help Jackson. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's reasonable. We got to, we got to tie this together. Daryl Worley. If you want to bet on preseason football, Daryl Worley will be the defensive MVP of these, this first preseason game. <laughs> if you see significant playing time in the second half, and this is my exact call last year, not changing it. I was right last year, by the way. <laughs> but uh, uh, Ardarius Washington could also be in there at the end of the football game. Um, they have guys that they want to get Braid and Kane in the job. I would not put it, put it past Harbaugh to use Worley and possibly Ardarius uh, Washington uh, as free safeties while they use a different strong safety in each half to try and – uh, work through this. Braid is he's in the run drills. He does other things. So he's he's going to be strong safety. Kane is really a dime back and special teams player. So he's not honestly. I, I, I he's he Braid and uh, Worley. So Kane Braid and Worley are the three guys really competing for the last roster spot to be assigned at safety. Mm-hmm. I think Worley is the clear choice for that, but we'll see how they how they play it out. Yeah, it'll be interesting. You uh, you were saying that Sanusi Kane has been a little disappointing this camp. Why would you say that? Um, don't think he's been in position uniformly well. Uh, the other day he had a he had a missed assignment that led to a touchdown in the right by the right pylon on you know which was clearly his responsibility. Uh, but I I would say generally speaking his his positioning playing from that back end half field slot has not been ideal fair okay um if we're, if we're talking about Bo braid i think uh you know it, it i'm not sure it's any better honestly so we'll see i think worley the case is is he really back from his injury uh, is he going to be okay um uh he's he's a he's a bigger um, more experienced player in terms of what he gives the ravens he's also a one year solution in some way but, I, but the other way I would look at it is Daryl Worley will learn the vet minimum for however long the Ravens want him at this point. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, he's not, he's not going thing. anywhere. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so hopefully he does play good and we're able to yeah. keep that in the back pocket because he's probably a handshake crew as well. So Yes, absolutely. He and Urban will be the two guys that will essentially give them four extra roster spots beyond the 53 because they have two accruing from the two that got, got added by rule this year. Yep. So, All right. Uh, Frazier, always a pleasure talking about this year. I hope folks out there have a lot to look forward to in terms of, of the preseason game. But Frazier, tell us uh, where they can contact you and talk football with you online. You guys can reach me at Twitter slash X at F underscore Rave 8. That's F underscore R-A-V-E 8. All right. Well, thanks again. We look forward to the uh, series this year again of uh, matchups that we'll do on a weekly basis. And uh, other folks out there, if you'd like to be on a film study short, hit me up. DMs are always open on Twitter. And I am still encouraging people to tell somebody else about the podcast. And you could do that via a review if you don't have anyone else to tell. Or maybe show an older person who doesn't use podcasts how to get to this online website at filmstudybaltimore.com. Look at the podcast tab and just listen to a podcast there. Um, and if anyone else, I'm, I'm also considering, I'll throw this out there taking on someone as an intern who would like to do work um, trying to promote the podcast 
And if you're interested in, in what that would entail, contact me directly via DM on Twitter. I'd love to hear from you. Frazier, uh, thanks again for all you do. And uh, we'll talk to you next week on Matchups.